wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis explores the Serengeti's link to humans' distant past. This area is often referred to as the cradle of mankind. From there, he visits our closest living relatives. It's always incredible to see chimpanzees. They're so close to ourselves. They just view us as another primate species that live side by side. And he visits Serengeti's nomadic people, the Maasai. You think we can maybe go visit your village? Definitely be born in this culture. We'll appreciate that. This is the Greater Serengeti in Tanzania. It's one of the most biologically diverse places on the planet. It's home to over 70 species of mammals, and it's the site of the wildebeest migration, the largest mass movement of animals on Earth. But there's more to the Serengeti than its wildlife. It's also one of the most important paleoanthropological sites in the world. On the southern Serengeti Plains in Olduvai Gorge, famed paleontologists Lewis and Mary Leakey made some of their most important fossil discoveries, discoveries that have been central to our understanding of early human origins and evolution. I'm standing on the edge of Olduvai Gorge, which is a really prominent site within the Great Rift Valley. This area is often referred to as the cradle of mankind because the Leakeys discovered two very prominent skulls here. Those skulls of Zymtanthropus and Hobo habilis date back to about two million years. The reason Olduvai Gorge is so unique is the fact that this used to be a massive lake a couple of million years ago where these hunter-gatherers or early hominids formed homesteads. It was uh, the perfect environment to live close to a food source. What's really interesting is the fact that Homo habilis, or the handyman, was discovered not more than 20 meters from Australopithecus, living side by side during the same time era. It might sound strange to have two ape-like species living close together like that, but today is no different. Further south in the Great Rift Valley are apes still living. And in other areas in Africa, there are species such as bonobos and gorillas, all living, same as us humans, in the Great Rift Valley. Tanzania has several populations of chimpanzees. The most well-known is in Gombe National Park, where Jane Goodall did her famous studies. But the most significant population is actually further south, in Tanzania's Mahale Mountains. Just arrived onto Mahale airstrip, and we're getting to an old dhow that's going to take us into the national parks. This is one of those unique parks where there's no roads. Jean wants to see Mahale's wild chimpanzees close up, where he can observe their behavior. And to do that, he's headed to Greystoke, a lodge on the shores of Lake Tanganyika that is only reachable by boat. I'm on Lake Tanganyika, which is just one of the most spectacular lakes I've ever seen. The largest body of unpolluted fresh water on the planet. Behind me is Mahali Mountain National Park, and this is one of the few parks where one can find viable populations of chimpanzees. On this side of the lake are very much two chimp populations, referred to as the M group and the K group, where in the 80s, the M group pretty much overthrew and almost completely demolished the K group. 
Um, in modern day, the K group is starting to come back, but it's a new population of chimpanzees that's very skittish and hard to see. It's estimated that the entire park has between 700 and 1,000 chimpanzees. Mahale Mountains National Park is open to tourists, but the lodges are all small occupancy. That, along with the fact that the area is remote and hard to get to, keeps it from being too overrun by tourists. And in a fragile ecosystem, that's a good thing. Here we are arriving at camp. It's, uh, it's always a very impressive sight. Jeff and Carrie, the managers at Greystone, along with the staff and resident Pelican, come out to greet Jean. Jean settles down in camp for the night. They will begin trekking in the morning. It's another really hard day in the office. The chimpanzees live in the mountains around Greystone. Researchers had been studying them for decades, so they're habituated to humans. This means Jean should be able to sit and observe them. But first, he has to find them. The home range of M Group spans a very large area. This is mountainous terrain. For Jean, it will mean a tough, steep hike through dense bush. Jean's guide is Mwiga Mambo, head guide and primate expert at Greystone. Mwiga is the second generation in his family to work with the chimps. His father worked on a research project in Mahale. This is our first morning and we're about to head off into the forest to see if we can find these chimps. What, what can we expect this time of year? Is it going to be easy, hard? What, uh, do, you, what do you think? Yeah, it's hard walking, really? honestly. Very yeah. hard walking. Okay. With limited time, Jean is keen to get started. The chimps are wild animals and aren't on his schedule. There's still no update from the trackers in terms of locating the chimpanzees this morning, but instead of sitting here on the beach, we're heading off into the forest to go and explore the low regions of the forest. The chimps are often easily found in the low-lying areas around the camp. Yeah. Let's keep on walking. But a recent shift in weather has sent the chimps higher up into the mountains in search of food. This means some serious climbing ahead for Jean with no guarantees. The chimps can get to areas that are inaccessible to humans. So the trio begins to head into the forest and up the mountain. Hmm. What's this? Strachnus inakua. They must clearly eat this inside part that is soft and smelling, very citrus-like. Chimpanzee, they have kenna and then they have a strong jaw. Okay, so they to, can break it. Yeah, they can break it. What can we expect? Is it going to be easy, hard? Yeah, it's hard walking, really? honestly. Jean Duplessis is in the Mahale Mountains, where he and head Greystoke guide, Mwiga Mambo, are on a quest to observe the social life of the chimpanzee. So we're biologically cousins to chimps and gorillas and share 98% of the same genetic makeup. What separates us from our hairy relatives is our large brains, our capacity for language, and the ability to create and use complex tools. Is this a termite mount? Yes. I know in Gombe, with Jane Goodall's project, they, they discovered that they fish for termites with sticks. Do they do the same here? No. Uh, here, they didn't fish from tamat mound, but yeah. they fish from the trees. There is an ant calling carpenter ants. They use tools too. So here, they don't use those sticks to fish for termites. What, what's quite fascinating is that it's all learned behavior. Obviously, some chimp in Gombe did that by accident, and there was a termite on, and that's how they learned it. And here in Mahali, maybe one of them was playing around with a stick in a tree and caught a carpenter ant. So it, it's more a matter of uh, a learned behavior that's brought over from generation to generation, and by chance it hasn't happened here that they are fishing for termite. Science has learned a lot from studying chimp behavior. 
Researchers and scientists have discovered medical treatments for diseases like malaria, diarrhea, and even anti-tumor medication that can be used by humans. And we've been hiking now for most of the morning. The trackers came out at 7 o'clock this morning to try and find the chimpanzees. But this time of year, they're high up in the mountains and in the valleys because that's where the only viable food source will be. Finally, after several hours of hiking, Jean makes his first sighting. It's one o'clock now and we just came across a group of females and infants. I'm wearing this face mask because a few years ago, there was a flu virus that was introduced to this group of chimpanzees and there was a dramatic decrease in chimpanzee numbers here in Mahali. So as a precaution, all guests coming into contact with chimps must wear these face masks at all times. Just down from me is two females sitting with an infant that's um, younger than a year. Um, one can see they're younger than a year because they, they've got this little fluff of white on their backsides. It's always incredible to try to see chimpanzees. They're so, just so close to ourselves. They're having a proper game here. The young ones chasing each other. So uh, what was all that about? The happen is uh, uh, two mothers fighting because of their children. It's, it's, it's pretty much just like humans with two, yes. two kids fighting and then the mothers end up fighting. Exactly. Yes. Although not overly disturbed by the presence of humans, the mothers are understandably protective. And it seems like they're still having a little bit of squabbles as they move up the hill, so we're just going to try and stay behind them. Yeah. It's just hard to keep up with them. It's very easy for them, obviously, moving through this undergrowth. It's extremely hard for us. This time of day is when they all kind of pass out a bit and take it easy. Although this group of females is off on their own, Chimp society has both a patriarchy and a hierarchy. To get a fuller picture of their social structure, Jean will need to find the males. Who is now number one? Alofu. Number one is uh, <clears throat> Primus, and then uh, he was challenged uh, upper male on that time, calling him, and then uh, Orion went up to be number number three. Mm -hmm. So he needed to support Alofu to took over to resume his position. Pim gets scared of him. So Pim he was need support from Primus, number three. Primus he was challenged Alofu. And then Alof gets scared of him. He disappeared with the one female calling Effie. It's very complicated. <laughs> it's a, there's a big power struggle going on. It's amazing. Seems like you are part of these politics. Yes. Like, because, a, like uh, a soap opera for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these females we've been tracking the whole day are part of a much larger group of between 60 and 70 individuals. And hopefully these calls and these little domestic and conflicts within this, this small group will draw the main group this way and um, uh, yeah, hopefully those dominant males will come and see what the trouble is here. The M group of chimps is broken down into several smaller groups. While there are still some males to be seen through the brush, Jean is still looking for the main group and the dominant males. These, these kind of calls are totally contact calls because the, the group is all over this valley. They are communicating with each other and are hopefully some of the ranking males will come and see where these females are, and we might run into them tomorrow. Yeah, it'd also be nice for you to go there and see what's going on, because it seems like it's changing on a daily basis. Yeah. It's getting late, so they call it a day. Mwiga leads John back down to Greystoke Lodge. 
Back at the lodge, the resident pelican is more forthcoming than the male chimpanzees. This uh, pelican is incredible. This pelican has become a fixture here, and manager Jeff from Greystoke fills in Jean on his backstory. So what's the deal with this bird? Yeah, the bird, he, he swam in off the lake about eight months ago. There had been a big storm, and um, next thing we knew, the bird was swimming ashore and um, started uh, chatting to our guests. I mean, you know, there's a bit of a daily routine to this guy. Yeah, it's, it's quite a relaxed daily routine. <laughs> he landed on the right beach, that's for sure. Nice seeing him out in the kayak with you. Oh, he loves it. He loves kayaking. He really wants to fish. But as a solo bird, it's a real challenge. Right. I mean, they normally fish as a flock, so they corral the fish, and then they all scoop with their huge pouches, and then they filter the water out, and that's how they feed. But as a solo bird, he doesn't stand a chance. An isolated pelican in the wild is vulnerable. This one is lucky. Jean hopes some of that luck will rub off on him as he heads into day two of his quest. Wildlife expert and safari guide, Jean Duplessis, is in the remote Mahale Mountains National Park. The park has the largest number of wild chimpanzees in Tanzania. And Jean is hoping he can get close enough to watch the chimps' social structure in action. From his base at Greystoke Lodge, Jean has put himself in the hands of its chief guide and primate expert, Mwiga Mambo. It's day two, and they've just come across a male and a female. Mwiga IDs him as Darwin, the third-ranked male chimpanzee. And he, uh, him and this female climbed up this big tree and they are feeding on ficus. It's really hard this time of the year for them to find a viable food source, so they really need to eat when they see food. Um, what they will do is they will pick with their hands and stuff their mouths full of figs, and one by one they would run these figs through their teeth, and um, that way they, they don't need their hands for the actual feeding anymore. Darwin is the number three ranked male in this group of chimpanzees, and that gives him the authority to take a female um, away for a couple of days. Well, in his case, he's been away with her now for three weeks. She's an estrus. That gives him the opportunity to completely monopolize her and be with her all the time. If they are in the big group, he's going to have to share a female and estrus with some of the other ranked males, especially the males that's ranked higher than him. It's a time of day where they, where they kind of lie down and take a bit of a siesta, but it's also a time for grooming. Mm -hmm. So he's never joining up with the main group in the, in the last couple of weeks? No, that's why you can see big group there on the mountains. Darwin is here. Okay. mean that he don't like to okay. share. So what do you think, what, what's up to Darwin now? Where is he, what's his plan? He, does he just kind of go up and down and try and avoid the main group the whole time? So yes. There's no real plan that you think he's after today? Also, the plan, if you see Mel doing like that, mean that uh, he needed to be on high rank. To be able to steal a female like Yes. That. Okay. Yeah, because uh, he won't do that if he's in, um, Low length, like a uh, number seven and like that. You won't do that. So we're going to leave Darwin. With Darwin fully occupied by his fig tree and the female, it's time to move on. We just got news from the trackers that they found the main group. Um, it's quite far from here, high up in the mountains. So we need to take a boat to go around to an easier place to launch from. We're on the boat now just to go around to the next beach, but I expect this is going to be a very hard hike. They are there on that hill.
start from here to find a trail behind this camp to head up into the hills. The main group of chimps has been spotted even further up the mountain. Jean and the crew have to start again at beach level, and they have a long, tough climb ahead of them. So M group is by far the most dominant group in Mahali, and it seems like there's a lot of politics at play inside this M group yeah. uh, that might make, make matters a little bit unstable for the rest of the group as well. The alpha male rules his power, mean that uh, if he gets sick, and then others, number two, he can take that opportunity to hit mm -hmm. him badly. Now in charge is uh, Primus, and then uh, I hope Darwin or Orion, he will take over. Is this kind of behavior everyday type of thing? Is, are we likely to see? Any time can happen. So we can expect some excitement. Exactly. The hike is a tough one, steep, rocky, and they have to go through a lot of brush. But after two hours, the hard work pays off. We just found the main group after a grueling hike up this mountain. And um, this is Primus, the alpha male is lying in front of me here. Primus, the alpha male, is clutching an enviable prize, the carcass of a colobus monkey. It's more than the little ones can resist. of meat which looks like a, a, a colobus monkey, a red colobus, and a young infant basically took it from him. That kind of created a bit of a commotion between the infants. Yeah, luckily they don't deal with us red colobus monkeys. It was interesting to see the two inf infants fight down below, oh. up in the trees. And there was a mother sitting down here, almost shouting instructions up to them to stop it, stop it, stop it. But uh, eventually she went up and then it got all out of hand. And then suddenly a lawful appeared, who's the second ranking male, to come and sort out all this trouble. It's a... Uh, quite common for chimpanzees to, to eat meat and it's kind of a delicacy for them, they really like it, but very hard to, to obtain because it's generally red colobus monkeys that they would catch and these monkeys are very nimble up in a higher canopy where obviously chimpanzees struggle to move around so far. So it's a, it's a massive team effort, effort in a hunting party that will go out and chase all these colobus high up into the canopy and just with a lot of aggression and movement and shaking of bushes, maybe one of them will fall and they will catch them on the ground. For now, the excitement seems to be over. Jean Duplessis is on his second day of his quest to find the M group of chimpanzees in the Mahale Mountains National Park. After a difficult hike, Jean and head Greystoke guide Mwiga Mambo have found the core group that includes the ranking males high up in the mountains. And they've located Primus, the alpha male who Mwiga says is also the most unstable. Who's the most aggressive in the group? Um, Primus and Orion. Right. This guy are crazy. <laughs> the Primus is alpha male now, and uh, he likes fighting a, a, a lot. Mm. 
Because he has a bad behavior. Most of chimps, they, they don't like him. That's why yeah. you can see he'll use like a force. Yeah, maybe one year to come, he will lose his power. And who is the, who do you think will be coming up next? Um, could be um, Darwin, because he did such good things, mm. and uh, Orion. Who's the oldest chimpanzee in the group? It's uh, Kalunde. He's right. 55 years old. Kalunde, he's kingmaker. Right. Um, if he decided to support you, most of majority of chimps, they're going to listen to him hmm. and then they're going to support. So who is he supporting now? Yeah. Who, who, who is he? Now he's working with a lot for many times. So seems like uh, he needed to support a lot to, <laughs> to resume his position. And has he been but, alpha? Yeah, he was alpha in 1991. Um, for one year okay. only. Huh. Yeah. Well, and why do you hope that uh, Darwin would become Alpha? Yeah, because he has a lot of support also. Even uh, Alpha, he support him. And then a lot of female also, they like him. Yeah, he's peaceful. Yeah. But Orion is ugly. He want to take over from number one. So when he do that, he convinced the female, the female agree, and then he going to those uh, number three, four, and five. When they agree, they're going to try to challenge the alpha man. sitting in between a group of ranking males and females and it's this quiet time for the time being where they are, are grooming each other. It, uh, it shows respect and strength and bonds between individuals. It's quite amazing how you can just sit here. You know, one kind of wonder if they just view us as another primate species that live side by side to them and uh, you know, don't have any negative effect on them. After spending time with the chimps, it's time for Jean to move on. But all the difficult hiking has paid off. Jean's had a chance to observe the chimps' dynamic social structure up close. It's always in constant change as lower-ranking males vie to move up in the hierarchy. Perhaps not so different from the way human societies work. Now Jean heads back to the Greater Serengeti. He's heading to Lake Natron in the Great Rift Valley. Here in the shadow of the sacred Odonio Lengai volcano is the center of the Maasai culture. The Serengeti Plains is known for its relatively undisturbed ecosystem, its rich wildlife, and the wildebeest migration. But it is also one of the key places where our species, Homo sapiens, evolved. We know that hominids have lived in the Serengeti for a long time, but a recent discovery on the shores of Lake Natron is helping rewrite the story of modern humans. Yeah, this looks like an adult, maybe a bit smaller. Yeah, here. just uh, for baby. Yeah, we've got a few sets of footprints here. It seems like um, these people were walking from over there, going down this way. Yeah. Uh, and they were all walking barefoot. In southern Serengeti or more in the Ngorogoro conservation area, there's another set of footprints. Those are called uh, the foot footprints of Loitole. That's the, the oldest proof of walking on two legs, and that humanoid was called Homo erectus. These footprints provide a link to humanity's distant past, but the area around Lake Natron and the eastern side of the Serengeti is currently home to the Maasai. This series of footprints are referred to as the Ingarisiru footprints, and it's very interesting because it's the oldest 
footprints of Homo sapiens in East Africa dating back to 120,000 years. The significance of these footprints are that it's a clear indication that modern day Homo sapiens lived in this area for a very long time, even a little bit longer than what was originally thought. The Maasai settled in the Serengeti around the 15th century and developed a very distinct culture that they have held on to in spite of pressures from the modern world. Little has changed in their lifestyle or culture in that time. They are still a tribe of semi-nomadic pastoralists. There are two things that define life for the Maasai, their cattle and their spiritual beliefs. The Maasai believe in a single God who influences their daily life. And there are a number of places around the greater Serengeti that they consider sacred. The most sacred is Oldonyo Lengai, an active volcano that the Maasai believe is their god. Oldonyo Lengai is very, very famous. Two years ago, we will have really trouble with dry season. Many, many cattle die around here, also yeah. Kenya. So I saw Maasai from Kenya. They are joining with a Maasai old men or old women from in this place and they joined together and they make a, a safari. I mean, about two days, they went to the top. And then it started raining. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was about after, after that, few months coming, it's raining and we have a big rain right now. Yes. According to Peter, some of these families actually packed up and they left the area altogether uh, in fear of bigger eruptions. So do you think people were doing something wrong to yeah. make the God angry? Yeah. It's a big, big eruption until okay. people, they move from the same place to another place. Where did the ash go? Did it go to Ngorongoro direction? The ash from Langai gets picked up by the wind. It's this nutrient-rich ash from these volcanoes that constantly replenishes the Serengeti. In one area, the ash has collected into a sand dune. It is one of the Maasai's sacred sites. I'm heading to the Shifting Sands, which is one of very few sacred places to the Maasai tribe. And it's out here on extremely barren terrain. The area I'm in is the Scythe and Gorogoro Conservation Area. The Maasai has lived here for a couple of hundred years. It's a great example of where people and wildlife can live side by side. The Maasai traditionally are not hunters. So they are a prime example of a tribe that can live in harmony with wildlife. There's uh, quite a few Maasai sheep herds around. Jean arrives at the Maasai sacred site and finds a welcoming committee. There's different kind of greetings for men and women in, in Maasai, or the language is called Ma. And um, you say different things when you greet a woman or a younger woman, older woman, or different age set of, of male as well. Nuyeyo? Takwenya? Hugo? Maasai culture is patriarchal and sharply divided along gender lines. The Maasai take Jean to see the sacred sand dune. The sand dune was created by a volcanic eruption out of Oldonio Lingai that's off in that direction and has now been moving downwind in approximately 25 meters every year. There's definitely some magnetic qualities to the sand that keeps it sticking together. Here you can see the sand falling over on itself. And this is essentially just a normal sand dune made up out of volcanic ash that have some magnetic qualities that kind of keep it together a little bit and it just keeps on falling over on itself like this. It's pretty cool. These shifting sands have some religious value to the Maasai tribe and it's believed that if a woman cannot conceive that they need to come and sleep in this vortex and that will help them to become pregnant. The women are raised to become wives and mothers and the men are Maasai warriors. These roles have been in place since the Maasai settled here in the 15th century. Wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis is at Lake Natron in the Great Rift Valley. It's the cultural center of the Maasai people. I'm at the Wildland Safaris Lake Natron camp and this is Mwinga, um, who's gonna be my Maasai guide. 
These cows are now being taken out into the field by the young boys who caught Lyoni, where they will go to pastures and um, just be out there for the whole day and be uh, laid back around six o'clock in the evening. The Maasai men are warriors, called Morani. I always wonder what is the responsibility of the Morani because, yeah. because 50 years ago, yeah. there was a lot more trouble with um, maybe lions and other tribes and things like that. And then the Morani were like the warriors and they were protecting yeah. the tribe. So, yeah. but, but today there's not so much trouble with warfare and you don't need to go and catch and steal cows. So what, is, what does the Morani do these days? The function of Moran now to do it is only to look for the peace and love for the community okay. and also to migrate with cow to the somewhere which have the enough grass right. or enough food and the enough water. So I find that very interesting what you say is like now the new function of them is to make sure that there's peace and love in the community. Yeah. Yeah, but of course, in, in the same way, it's also protecting the, yeah. the culture. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think that, uh, that's great. <laughs> this enclosure here seems to where they are keeping the goats yeah. at the night, baby the baby goats. goats. Yeah. What's interesting is that it's a mini representation of how the, the main Maasai houses are being constructed, where they, they take the branches from a cordial tree and then packing it with dung all the way up the walls and even on the inside and then they will smoothen it out with mud on the outside to give it the nice red orchid type of look. Besides all the modern technology that surround the Maasai tribe, they still choose to live in these very traditional houses and a very traditional lifestyle. And I mean, you might, you might have a watch and a, and a cell phone, but you know, you still... <laughs> you still uh, um, that's one of the things that I always admire about Maasai, so this clung onto this culture. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. In spite of their reputation as warriors, the Maasai are not hunters. Their traditional diet includes meat from the animals they raise. They also drink raw cow blood and milk. Uh, the Morani are going to draw some blood from a cow's neck. And yeah. these, are, these are special tools that they use to kind of get the, get the blood out. It's like an arrow yeah. that they shoot yeah, in. Sure, yeah. Okay. Is that still, still, that's still really a big part of the Maasai diet? Yep. Of course, okay. Yeah. Sure. The major part, you think? Yep. <laughs> yeah. In Cali? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's very sharp. Uh, yeah. There's the. Looks like a young one. Yes, a young one. <laughs> It's a little kid with the calabash. Yeah. That's what they that they carry the blood in. Yeah. <laughs> so how much blood do you take then, Wingo? We not too much. Okay. They're now gonna take this calabash and get some fresh milk in there. <laughs> So if you don't stir it, it goes hard, it goes solid. Oh boy. You definitely need to be born in this culture to appreciate that. <laughs> Lactose and protein intolerant. <laughs> How is it? It's like coffee. It's <laughs> like coffee. Sure. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see my name on here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Trying doing, getting this to Starbucks. <laughs> like, uh... <laughs> Jean is heading to the Ngorongoro Crater Highlands, where Mazigio tented camp works with the local Maasai to give tourists some insight into their traditions. The Maasai's semi-nomadic lifestyle allows their livestock to thrive despite the relatively dry climate. But the landscape provides other economic opportunities as well. The traditional role of the warriors used to be to enrich the tribe and that, that used to take on the form of going at war with your neighboring clans and stealing their cows and in these modern days, that's obviously frowned upon a little bit. 
So uh, the more modern way to do that is to get um, cash from tourists and it's basically just the evolution of the tribe. Tourism is now a major source of revenue for the Maasai. But the Maasai don't often open their homesteads. Instead, they use elements of their traditions to create attractions for the tourists. Jean is at a recreation of an opul. It's a ceremony involving a feast of meat that is only for the men. A traditional opul will take place away from the village and last two or three days. Today we got a message that we are coming, so we prepare our traditional food. Normally our traditional food is meat and milk and blood. We took a blood without killing from the neck of the cow. In a, in a lot of ways, the saving grace for wildlife in Tanzania is the fact that Maasai can live side by side with wild animals. And um, the reason is because it's just not in their tradition to kill wild animals for food, where most other tribes in Tanzania will, will do that. But all of these areas that's bounding Maasai village land is safe, where one can still go quality game viewing as well. Of course, Maasai are not killing the, the wild animals. So why is it that the Maasai has never went like other tribes where they would hunt wild, wildlife? That's a good question. You know, the Maasai people, we believe, uh, we believe in God, for one God for everyone in the world. Yeah. White people, black people. So our beliefs tell us that we have a very special gift coming from God as animals. Mm -hmm. We're herd people. We keep livestock, cows, goat, sheep. So Masa never eat wild we animals? We never eat any game yet. Mm -hmm. Be nice with a bit of chili sauce. Mm -hmm. The chief here say, not allowed. Only meat, no salt, no chili. Just like that. It was actually pretty good. Tastes very goaty. These uh, Maasai warriors are called Morani are now um, starting to prepare soup that's made from boiled up goat intestines. Normally the Maasai people we never use the soup without the herbs. Then the herbs come from the different plants. It's enjoying an early evening snack. You guys, do you eat this? No? Haven't. <laughs> Containing a lot of stomach lining and heart and lung. Yeah. Wildlife expert and safari guide John Duplessis has been getting up close to both chimpanzees and humans in his exploration of the changing face of hominid life on the Serengeti. Humans lived here from as far back as 30 to 40,000 years. Now he's up early to survey the landscape from above and to look back even further. Hominids have been living on the Serengeti Plain for millions of years. In fact, not too far from where I'm standing now are the famous footsteps of Laitoli, which date back three million years. And those are the earliest form or signs of humans walking on two legs. Since then, up until now, humans have utilized this great wildlife expanse. From Australopithecus to Homo sapiens, they all share the common trait of walking on two legs. But it is the privilege of humans alone to survey this land from above, to understand its past, and hopefully to protect its future. This morning, we're taking to the sky in this hot air balloon to get a little bit of a new perspective of this beautiful countryside. OK, we are flying along the Serronera Valley, and this valley collects water from open area and take that water to Gurumeti River. It's interesting seeing this area from the air, wondering how much has changed over the last 3 million years since Homo erectus actually took his first steps. I actually expect that it looked a lot different here. 
um, before the eruption of Ngorogoro, where this massive ash cloud fell over here, and that's what gives this area this great characteristic of these open plains. It's debatably hundreds of meters of thick ash that covered all these valleys. I'm trying to follow the river. Yeah, it's amazing up here. Somewhere there? Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll be doing canoeing in this river. Just flew over two May lions. Beautiful, clearly the dominant pair of this area. Very undeterred by their balloons. These open plains are not really that conducive to, to the way humans want to live. Even though there's a huge amount of game in the, in the wet season and the dry season, it's extremely barren and there's very little to eat for anything from hominids all the way through to predators. So uh, I would think that the area was much more ideal for humans to live and evolve uh, prior to the eruption of Ngorogoro Crater. These river systems are like lifelines. The Serengeti is a remarkable feat of nature. It was born in a catastrophic eruption of the Ngorongoro volcano millions of years ago, creating lush plains that sustain an incredible range of wildlife. It's where our distant ancestors walked and evolved as part of a self-sustaining ecosystem, where every creature, from the smallest insect to the massive bull elephant, plays their unique part. It's the site of the world's greatest mass migration of land animals. It's a window into what the world looks like when it's in balance. How nature, humans, and wildlife can coexist and live in harmony as it was meant to be. This is the Serengeti. <laughs>